He always has a he always has an opinion. I've been too long in Sweden. Yeah. You have an opinion but in every place. Oh okay. Do you want me to do the honors? Oh, sure. Okay. We've now come to the more exciting of the two lectures. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure to introduce Rolf Dogger. He's uh, professor, assistant professor, assistant professor, associate, associate okay. professor at Linköping uh, University uh, in Sweden. Um, Rolf uh, completed his undergraduate degree, I assume, at the University of Linköping yep. as well, and finished his doctoral work there as well under the direction of Andrew Berger, who's well known to us here, um, since he, he was a postdoc here many years ago. The focus of Rolf's PhD thesis was in CW nears of the brain and exclusion of interfering signals coming from the scalp. Uh, came here as a postdoc working with Andy Durkin, Bruce Conger, David Kuchia. He did a lot of work in the spatial frequency domain, imaging for a variety of applications. Also, as really, I think, was one of many people who catalyzed the field to getting really good batch of measurements um, for, you know, to standardize, um, you know, optical properties and, and also looking at some very thin, superficial tissues, multi layer tissues. Um, and so he's, um, you know, really very versatile, both in optical design, phantom making, and, and biomedical application of these techniques in biomedical. Uh, so he's going to talk to us on how you can try and estimate optical properties of real tissues. So let's welcome and yeah, we'll keep this kind of a little bit more relaxed and informal, so interrupt, heckle from the back. <laughs> um, but yeah, from the front. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, what we're going to start to do since up to this point, you've been talking a lot about modeling and forward models and how to simulate different things. You know, when you come into an experimental situation, you know, usually it's this other thing where you want to now try to figure out what the optical properties are, not what would a model simulate if you were given a certain uh, you know, set of optical properties. So, you know, this is kind of like one of the first, you know, I'll say in air quotes, simplest uh, approaches to actually start to measure what absorption and scattering are from tissues. Um, but we will kind of go through the kind of concept of now transitioning towards inverse solutions versus forward models, what those differences are, and then in this particular case, what this forward model is, how it works, how it addresses the issues already pointed out with radiative transport, and then get into the practical stuff of, okay, if this is how it works, this is how you can get optical properties from it, how do you actually make the measurement, what do you really need to think about, where does model and experiment start to deviate from each other and kind of go through some practical examples from that. So, you know, with this, this is more just for me rather than for you, but just to kind of keep myself honest and on track, you know, really there are three things that I wanted to kind of convey in this lecture. So if I don't, uh, let me know and, and criticize me. But, uh, you know, the first is really trying to understand the kind of foundational aspects of this adding doubling method. You know, I mean, this is something that is claimed to be an exact solution of radiated transport, and that's a very rare thing. Um, but it's exact under very extreme conditions. So again, you know, it's looking at slabs of tissue. There are a lot of different considerations. So it's important to say, if this is a tool, understand the concept of the tool, the limitations. So when you use it, you use it in the right way, not for the wrong thing. And then how do we use these solutions experimentally? So you know, if this is something that if you're given optical properties, it will give you what the reflectance and transmittance will be. In practice, we measure reflectance and transmittance, and we want to get back to what those optical properties are. So how do we get back to that? How do we make the measurements? And then how do we utilize this method to extract these optical properties? And then the final part is the more pragmatic approach is it's 
with the experimental aspects. You know, what does it actually take? What do you need to consider? What are the kind of components and elements in a measurement with this technique? Um, and kind of to get some bearing on, you know, when can you use this? How can you use this? And what you need to be aware of when venturing? You know, how can things go wrong? So that's kind of the overview that we're going to try to go through and um, try to break it up into smaller consumable parts. Um, but <laughs> we will, you know, now kind of start again a very brief introduction. You know, it's been mentioned before. It will go into more detail in a few days. And, you know, um, when it comes to inverse solver methods, Carol is going to be talking about that in, you know, gruesome detail in a very good way. But you know, to kind of say for the context of what we're going to be talking about today. You know, I kind of approach a forward model as something that describes what happens, you know, when you have light going into tissue and you know what the tissue is. So what happens to the light when you know the tissue? And again, parameters and inputs that we use to describe how light interacts with tissue. You know, we need to know what the absorption is, the reduced scattering, anisotropy, index of refraction, so on and so forth. Those are the different things that we can kind of see what happens to the light. And that will then generate our outputs, which hopefully now you are feeling comfortable with radiance and fluence and those types of terms. <laughs> and again, you know, what happens to the light within media volumes or at boundaries, and how do we utilize that going forward? So, you know, forward models is if you know what the tissue is, you can figure out what will happen to the light in that tissue. You know, the more relevant case to what we have today is, you know, it's, you know, what do we want to know is what are the optical properties of the tissue based on how the light interacts with it. So, you know, the problem here with this is that, you know, our medium is unknown. It's a black box. Whereas in the forward model, that's the one thing that we do know. And in general, the parameters that we have from an experimental perspective are typically usually less than the input parameters we need to do the forward model. So we have, you know, the issue is tissue is a black box, and our methods are ill-posed. So those words will come up every single time you hear somebody talking about an inverse <coughs> model. I, mean, I can remember my first conference going to a chromography session and that was the thing everything everybody said in every single talk. Oh, well, tomography is an ill-posed problem. You know, after five talks in a row where that was the first sentence stated, you got a little annoyed, but <laughs> it's important to repeat that over and over because sometimes you can forget. Um, and, you know, but the last part is, is with the inverse model is, you know, even though you have a black box, you have an ill-posed problem if you can go through and make careful selections of your model, um, your assumptions on the tissue property to start to kind of guide and narrow things down, apply the appropriate constraints to your measurement geometry and experimental conditions, an inverse solution is achievable. So it's not a guarantee, but you have to really think it through, but those are the kind of challenges. And so to kind of show graphically, you know, a forward model, you have your tissue as your input, you have your model that will predict the light, and your output is what happens to the light. And the inverse model is you have measurements of what happened to light, then you try to put it into some model of transport and try to back out what must be the optical properties present in this black box in order to create these results. And oftentimes, side by side, you know, okay, one's going forward, one's going back. You know, it's like a reversible process, and that's the biggest mistake is those aren't the same. So it's not as, you know, a forward model and inverse model are just walking forward or backward. Forward models are deterministic. Inverse solvers aren't, typically. I don't know, is there a deterministic inverse solver? Well, at least Mears law. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just straight up absorption. I mean, yeah, I'm like, you know, there, there should be something that exists. It's just everything in my head, I'm like, no, no, that's just too difficult. No, that's it. But, yeah. yeah. So, 
you know, I mean, and that's the challenge is, you know, it's always going to be harder to go backwards than going forwards. So again, just in general, you know, this goes beyond the scope of just in presenting Dublin. But, you know, keep in mind that there are a variety of models and methods that have been developed to describe lead, lead transport. There's a lot of different ways to approach it, a lot of different measurement geometries. All have their strengths and weaknesses, so it is important to know what this is. So if you have some other technique, you know at least some reference to say what your technique can do better or worse than something else to really narrow down what would be the best for the case you're looking at. And again, you know, there's strengths and weaknesses in terms of computational burden versus accuracy, classic comparison between analytical methods, you know, diffusion approximation versus Monte Carlo. You could have something that's very accurate, but it's going to take some time. And you know, where is the cutoff in your particular case? Sometimes you have the time, that's fine. Other cases, you know, you have to then consider, well, I can only get it up to a certain point, but you know, I have to have it fast enough for it to be relevant in my application. You know, measurement complexity versus acquisition time, you know, more complex instruments tend to have, you know, more moving parts, it takes longer to acquire certain cases, certain tissues, you can't wait that long, so on and so forth. But, you know, that's the kind of general consideration, and that's where it's important to not just know one technique, but to know adjacent techniques as well. Because, you know, there might be certain things that your technique excels at, but you want to be sure and be aware of where other techniques might do something better. And, you know, whether that's relevant to what you're doing, it's good to have that context. So again, this kind of general key to successful research, you know, is to understand when and or where each method is best to address the problem you wish to address. I mean, the other key to research is just being lucky, but you know, <laughs> that is a little bit out of your hands. This is actually something you can do, so we'll just focus on this aspect. So when we talk about this forward model, this adding doubling, you know, what is this technique? And again, we talk about radio transport, we're talking about radiance. In radiance, you have spatial coordinates, you have angular com components, you have temporal components to it. It's a very complex variable. And the basic and the most fundamental strategy to keep in mind in terms of adding doubling is, you know, since radio transport is such a difficult problem to solve directly, rather than trying to make approximations on the integral and the phase function, so on and so forth, it looks at the sample itself and says, what can we do with the actual dimensionality of our problem? And it, can we reduce the dimensionality of radiance to try to simplify this problem? And so the basic thing here is, is you know, where you have all these different dimensions in space, angle, and time, adding doubling starts off with, well, can we set up a measurement geometry? Can we set up a sample where it can be reduced to just a single dimension? And so here we have this idea of a slab of an optical material with infinite lateral extent. So again, it's homogeneous, you know, it's going through. Now we can do a lot of simplifications in terms of the lateral information if it's homogeneous, and also go through and say, if it's just things going forward and backwards, simplify the angular component. Say it's a constant material, then we can reduce the temporal aspects of that as well we at least now begin to break a lot of that stuff down. And, you know, the big take home is, is in doing that, you get simple direct solutions. And again, like Boston was talking earlier, you have these uh, simple mu A times mu transport types of solutions to these different elements. And you can get something where you have radiance in the forward direction, radiance in the backward direction, you know, my lecture is over. <laughs> but, I mean, that's the whole thing is where we get. So, you know, how do we get this? So to kind of really step through and try to, you know, really kind of reinforce this kind of conceptual level of, of this type of situation is, you know, we can look at our radio transport equation. You know, we have the changes over time, changes over space, where the loss function due to 
absorption and scattering, you have your fun little integral with the scattering and your source term. You know, if we go through and say we can kind of change the dimensionality of the problem we're trying to solve, you know, first assumption is let's just say it's steady state. And by saying it's steady state, we remove the temporal aspects. We get rid of our time derivative to say it's a constant type of problem. And from the radio transport equation, now it gets reduced to this equation. And then we say we also want to reduce the spatial component, saying, OK, if it's this slab geometry that's homogeneous lateral extent, you don't need x, y, and z anymore. You just have z. You can go through, or at least in my old notes, it's x. But you know, we can now simplify the dimensionality here. This simplifies the spatial derivative here. So you just have the partial derivative over one spatial dimension. And you know, it reduces this equation now a little bit more. And then. The last is, is we want to have this geometry where we can integrate over all angles. And if we're doing that, that really addresses the biggest pain in this entire equation, which is that. So, you know, if we're just going to sum up all over the angles, then, you know, that basically does that elimination of the calculating the actual angular dependence within that integral. We're just summing it we get these two coupled equations. And again, breaking this up to the total angular component going forward, the total angular component going backwards. So we just kind of split this up into these two hemispheres. You know, what's stepping forward, what's stepping backward? I don't care at what angle. It's just if you're going forward, backward, you are in two different categories. And in doing this, now we have a very simple coupled partial differential equation. And hopefully, because I don't want to you know, spend too much time on the math, you can see from the previous lecture that it's now in this state where you can start to have these little functions and get a nice exponential solution to those types of equations. So you have forward radiance, backwards radiance in this coupled equation. So the classic way is, is now you have your thin tissue, your slab here, where you have something from the top boundary, so boundary 0 versus boundary 1, radiance going in, radiance coming out. If there's any light coming from this thing, you have radiance coming in, radiance coming out, that you can start to kind of build these up as operators where you can start to say, OK, if we wanted to calculate what the radiance is exiting boundary 1, you have the transmission operator for your radiance coming from entering from boundary 0. So that times some transmittance function here and some reflectance from any light that might be in this position coming back here. Similarly, to go in the other side, to look at that, you know, we can build up these operators. And so it's a kind of transfer function from boundary 0 to boundary 1, boundary 1 to boundary 0 with these different operators. And again, in a single slab, we know that if we consider where our light is coming from, so if we have light coming from one direction, we know that there's no light coming from this other part. This drops out, and we have a nice simple relationship where we can define with these exponential functions. So I'm going to just talk around the math, not bring up too many more equations, but hopefully at least the concept of what we're building up here is at least somewhat clear enough in being able to appreciate that you have a simple function here that you can then start to think of what's going down, what's going up from different boundaries. And if you can define these little transfer functions here, 
you can begin and start to propagate at discrete distances the different changes from here to here to here going on, so on and so forth. So that is the basic concept, and why is it really useful? And also, why is it called adding doubling? So there are two key elements of building up this definition of radians at boundaries with transfer functions of either in the forward or backward direction. So, you know, when we're talking about the doubling aspect is the fact that if we're going to go through, have these definitions at different boundaries, and have something go through here, that we know what the transfer functions are here. If our source is coming on this end, we have a transmittance function of light coming through, a reflectance function of light coming back out. But having those calculations, then again, you can then add discrete thicknesses of those lengths and basically double all that and propagate those solutions all the way through. So you have a way of building that up to say, if you have a tissue with a certain set of optical properties at a certain thickness, if you double the thickness, you can then propagate those results to the next block, to the next block, because we have the definitions at every single boundary. The adding part now is also considering the fact that since we have these discrete operators and discrete calculations, that if you have a slab of unknown property sandwiched by slabs of known optical property, so practical case here, we're thinking of a cubet or microscope slides with a tissue sandwich in beneath, that if we know the properties of this sample and the properties of this sample don't know this, we can still also calculate what the transfer function would be for here, what the transfer function would be here and here, and basically add all those components up. So it becomes this versatile tool to go through and do a very simple calculation, which is transport rigorous, of what the radians would be at discrete locations you know, over variable thicknesses of the same material or combinations of different materials because you could have the transfer functions for each material independently defined. So, you know, that's what makes it kind of versatile as a model. And, you know, why is this powerful? It's an exact solution of the radio transport. Yes. So you're basically getting like this whatever piece of thing and then you cut like a slab out of it and then you figure out what that slab is and then you basically add multiple slabs together to figure out the bulk. Yeah, so you can kind of extrapolate <coughs> multiple thicknesses. So if you were to know one piece and say, all right, you're going to go through to larger and larger volumes, mm -hmm. you can then go through and model based on your solution here and just propagate that mm -hmm. thicker and thicker. Yes. So in terms of the second example you took, you had two of the slabs on either side that you knew the properties about, yeah. the one that you will figure out by calculating it, and yeah. then you will just add all three of them? Yeah, so I mean, again, we're at this point, I'm also getting ahead of myself, we're talking about the forward model. So it's basically saying you have one set of known optical properties here, a different set of known optical properties here, and then the same as this, or it could be something different here, that you can basically calculate at every stage and know how it would propagate in both the forward and backward direction. So if it's known, you can start to basically add different samples together or with the doubling, if it's the same thing that you can scale directly as a function of that <coughs> thickness. So those are the versatile parts. You know, the first part is not necessarily relevant in the tissue applications as much as this would be for the slides types of situations and stuff like that. But those are the kind of key features, is that it really reduces this complex RTE into these kind of transfer function types of approach, which makes it scalable, but transport rigorous. So, you know, it's an exact solution. So, you know, with caveats, of course, there really is no restriction on what amount of absorption and scattering is. Yes? For that last example, is it to your advantage to know, to make it identical on either side or make them different? Um, I mean, I think 
it's from the practical standpoint, it's you know usually the situation the, the analogy would be having glass slides or a cuvette. So you know from the practical standpoint, it's easier. There there's no advantage of making it different. Um, you know, if they were different, it should still work. But in practice, you know, you, why would you want to do that? Um, yeah, well, if you want a layered model, you could change the, the optical properties for each layer and yeah. put them together. Yeah, it's just when it comes to the inverse solver part, you want to know everything but one layer in order to isolate what that is. So that becomes the other kind of limitation that we'll get into later. But um, but yeah, no, there's. No limitation as to having them matched or symmetric in that regard um, in the forward model sense, but just in practice, yeah, that's the, the thing where we're just trying to drive it towards where you would use that. So, you know, again, with this approach, you know, it's an exact solution. There's no restrictions on scattering anisotropy. Yeah, we're assuming still phase functions are present, but that's kind of embedded in the whole process. You know, internal reflections and at boundaries are included. So again, with the adding at every boundary, we can add in Fresnel reflections and all that that we talked about before and build things from that. You know, on the flip side, what are we giving up from all this? So again, you know, we are simplifying it down to a one dimensional case. You know, we live in multiple dimensions, so you know, there's a certain violation of physics that we need to understand and appreciate the context of what we're doing by giving things up. So the simplest thing is, yeah, it's a steady state type of situation. So we can't look at dynamics, we can't look at fluctuations. You, know, you have to limit to what it is you want to measure. So typically, ex vivo tissue doesn't really do that much. That's a pretty good case. Uh, for this, but you know, it also has to be uniform. You have to have homogeneous tissue. It's assuming, again, this spatial uniformity, this infinite lateral extent. So you know, it assumes that you know it's a homogeneous tissue. That if you sample one part, it's the same as the other. So when light propagates through, it experiences the same thing. And we have to assume. Similar to that, that the absorption and scattering must be evenly distributed through the tissue because of the assumptions we're making. We are, the model is solutions at boundaries. So it assumes that everything in between is even. So you can't have any variations of concentration throughout the tissue volume you're probing because this exact solution is only exact at boundaries. It doesn't work in the volumes. So yeah, so that's, the kind of key part to that. And yeah, so you know, when we go through, you know, we have our adding double doubling as a forward model. And what it does is it can describe the total reflectance and transmittance at boundaries. Um, you know, it simplifies it down to one dimension. That's how it's, you know, that's what you're giving up in order to achieve this. And you know, this Simplified model reduces input parameters to, and again, I say only five. So, you know, we have our absorption, scattering, anisotropy, index of refraction, and thickness of the sample. So again, you know, when we're talking about our inverse solver, there's always that ill-posedness. If what we're measuring is reflectance and transmittance, those are two parameters, and we already have five, but you know, we can measure the thickness independently. Uh, we can assume an anisotropy. We can assume a index of refraction. Is that a safe assumption? It could vary. Um, but you know, then we have basically two measurements, reflectance and transmittance. With these assumed or independently measured, with two input parameters, the absorption and reduced scattering. So that kind of reduces everything to a posed problem. Two e equations, two unknowns. Um, so what we want to do next is to say, well, if this model, given an absorption and scattering, can give us the reflectance and transmittance, 
in reality, we measure reflectance and transmittance. We want to get what those absorption and scattering values are. So that's the kind of next part. But this is kind of where things are being set. <clears throat> so again, I'm kind of going very fast. It's a lot of text. But hopefully, just the general concepts will come in. And as we start to talk about the measurement more and the inverse, of, hopefully, things will come into place. But if not, please interrupt. So that was the forward model. So now we have this setup where we have these different model inputs for the adding doubling. And again, we can kind of do various techniques to reduce it. So again, in addition to um, what we said before about making assumptions on anisotropy index and measuring the thickness, we can also do some unitless parameters, you know, things that Boston loves to do. So why why have you know something in meters when you can have it unitless and yeah, not ratios? <laughs> That always takes me always, you know, a little extra time whenever I'm reading your papers just to go through and say, yeah, but if I have five millimeters, what does this mean? <laughs> but, you know, so oftentimes in this, we'll talk about, you know, this A and tau parameter, A being the albedo that was already mentioned before, so it's common, so hopefully that's still something you're beginning to feel comfortable with, and tau being this optical thickness parameter. And again, from the measurements, you know, we get this exact solution. We can assume index of refraction, and that can be handled also with any of the boundary reflections. And our goal now is to really go through and say, if we have a function that will tell us what reflectance and transmittance are based on absorption and scattering, now what we want are answers for absorption and scattering based on reflectance and transmittance. And this will involve an iterative strategy to go through. So how does this work? And again, you know, this will be brought up again in other techniques as well for this kind of iterative approach to doing these inverse model-based inverse solutions. So you know, the goal is, is you start with a guess of optical properties. You make some assumption to say, if I think this tissue slab has this much absorption and that much absorption, I should be able to measure this much reflectance and this much transmittance. And then, you know, you can calculate that. You can then make those measurements and say, how close am I? You know, if I'm off by a certain amount, well then, you go back and say, if they're not the same, try another guess. Then I get closer, and you continue to iterate and continue to loop until your model results match your measured results, and then you go through. So yeah, I shamelessly stole this from your presentation last year, um, because yeah, I like the, the optimism of, you know, if you can finally get to the answer, you get to publish. <laughs> but yeah. So that is this whole thing. And again, that's where you know this forward model and inverse model, they look side by side, very similar. But again, what it is is it's basically an inverse solver is you're doing the forward model over and over and over again until you're happy with the, the result. So it's just running forward models multiple times. But you know, that's how it works, and you know, that is a very common thing. So when we look at the adding doubling, you know, how unique are these solutions? So, you know, we said that this was, you know, making assumptions on index and isotropy, measuring the thickness, we have a posed problem, two equations, two unknowns. But, you know, how unique are these solutions? How easy is it to really differentiate one thing from another? So, you know, we can look at a range of reflection versus transmission to see what those combinations are. And again, you know, this is just looking at the albedo and anisotropy parameters. But what we can see is that for certain ranges, you get a very nice linear spread, a very even distribution of things, indicating that you, know, you can get a very nice result based on 
you know, a nice good signal to noise transmission or reflection, but you can see in certain ranges here where if you have very weak transmission values that it becomes very compressed. So any small amount of noise can create huge errors. So there's that kind of distribution thing. And this is where we start to set up this idea of it's an exact solution, but can you have a good enough measurement to get to that exact solution? So how sensitive do you have to be in your measurement in order to be able to really utilize this? So it could be, you know, a perfect solution, but if you can't measure it, it's a useless solution. Now you should mention that this is that you've done a bait and switch because you, this is an amuse of a amuse of s grid because yeah. there's a collimated transmission measurement that's constraining the whole problem. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's, take it as a pretty picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, because I mean, you know, I come from the lookup table approach from uh, spatial frequency domain imaging, and that's where I see the same thing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And again, you could also try to reparameterize that to try to make it a little bit better. But again, the the, the big take home message really is, is you know, even though it's an exact solution, is it a measurable solution or not? So that's the high level run through now of the um, inverse solver part. So we have the kind of fundamental concept of how adding doubling works and how you can then do the inverse in order to say from measurements, how do we get to parameters as opposed to from parameters, how can we simulate what the measurements should look like? You know, and now we want to try to go through and say, well, let's think about this problem a little bit more. So we've set stuff up, but there's still no real payoff. You know. So when it comes to this, we have the different pieces in place. You know, how do we actually make these total reflectance and transmittance measurements? You know, experimentally, how do we actually capture this data? Because again, we live in a multi-dimensional world. This solution is just in 1D. So how do you make a measurement that is in multiple dimensions and collapse that down to parameters that only exist in one dimension. So again, in this 1D model, we've integrated all angular uh, contributions into a single component. It either is going forward or backward. So how do we make a measurement that captures all the forward angles and backward angles? You know. And again, you know, this comes down to starting to look at the instrumentation. So the most critical component for this is what's referred to as an integrating sphere. And integrating spheres are pretty much exactly what they sound like. So they are spherical objects that have highly reflective coatings on the inside. And so the idea there is that light entering that sphere at any angle is going to be just reflected off of the surface and literally performing that mathematical oper operation of integrating all that light. And so you know, we have something like this thing here. So we have our sphere. We have a highly reflective white coating on the inside here. We have a little detector up here. So we have our sample, and light goes through the sample. It's scattered in the forward direction, so the transmittance at any angle over here is going to be captured by the sphere, and so it's just going to sum all those angles up. So for transmittance, we put the sample at what's referred to as the entrance port. So light comes in from the one side, and we integrate all the light that comes out the other side. And then for reflectance, what we have is that light enters this side of the sphere. So again, this is assuming a collimated beam in this geometry. So collimated light coming in here. And so it will only be interacting with the sphere if it's scattered at other angles. 
So it integrates over all of these other angles from here. And again, detecting from this. So, yes. So in practice, do we need to uh, take into account the uh, area of the little holes in the area yeah. of the detector? Yeah. So we want to be, you know, again, this is a physical object. It's not an idealized object. You know, the model is all idealized, so we need to account for the fact that it assumes a full 4 pi integration. You know, we have gaps in this, and so we need to kind of account for that. And so that becomes the later slide parts where all the headaches start to arise. But, you know, again, we have this way of actually trying to go through and make a pretty good approximation of this type of measurement and how to really capture all the different angles that are going to be going on in the forward and backward direction. So, yes, that's exactly the next slide. So, you know, we need to allow reality to set in. So again, it's not a perfect integrator. It's pretty good, but as you said, there are things that are missing. There are holes, so it's not every single angle. There are a few angles that are missing. Um, you know, that reflectance and transmittance are relative measurements. So we also have to have a way of calibrating what that is. Um, these are physical measurements, so they will contain noise potentially bias in all that. So we need to start to think of all the different things from the measurement aspect, because any slight variation, as we showed, it's a nonlinear <coughs> map of reflectance towards optical property. You know, we need to understand that any source of error can kind of really bias where we are on that map. And again, the model assumes that it's an infinite in lateral extent. These are finite samples. So, you know, how big do you need to be for something to be considered infinite? You know, how small does the collimated beam have to be relative to the sample, rather relative to the port side? You know, we have to make some approximations. It's not perfect in all that. We live in a physical world. So, you know, these are the different things that we start to need to consider and this is where we have to be very careful on our measurement perspective. So, you know, we've done all these different tricks from the modeling to get an exact solution, but it doesn't exist in the physical world. So now how can we take the physical world and make a measurement that closely approximates this idealized case that the model solves? So again, when we start to talk about this and the kind of physical reality, you know, we have our integrating spheres, but they are not perfect. So walls are not necessarily 100% reflective. There can be some variation based on what sample you use, um, you know, how often you use it, whether it gets dusty or not. Um, there's a lot of different things, but you know, I mean, this has been illustrated that you would think that there is a linear representation in the response in terms of reflectance and transmittance. That is actually not the case. So there is some nonlinear responsivity that you need to kind of characterize that when you measure something versus what it actually is, there's a little bit of a bias. So there's a correction factor for that. You know, not all the angles are integrated. We have holes in them. And, you know, luckily, people have gone through and made a lot of different co corrections secondary corrections and all these different little things for these types of uh, parameters. So like the wall reflectance and you know, how many times does light bounce off? How does that impact things? Um, so, you know, you need to have a well-characterized sphere. You have to have all these different secondary corrections, but, you know, people have done that. So you don't have to, so be grateful. Yeah. Uh, during the reflectance with integrating spheres, um, when the sample is placed at 180 degrees, is there also transmittance through the sample or is it closed? Yeah. So there's always light going through the sample as well. So behind it, you want to make sure there's nothing that will bounce light back or anything like that. that you know, the idea is, is that anything that will go through that sample, you're just getting the kind of 
radiance in the backward direction, and that the radiance in the forward direction still passes through, but it just goes off and doesn't get detected by your sensor. So, so yeah, you want to keep things dark and make sure that you don't have any spray light on that. Yes? Uh, again, in practice, is this the one situation where time is your friend and you let the measurement go on for minutes or hours? It improves. Or the time, time is never your friend, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it takes time to make these measurements anyway. So yeah, I mean, you know, there is the whole thing about longer integration times, averaging for the noise and being careful. But you know, if you aren't addressing a lot of these other imperfections first, no matter how good your signal and noise is, if there are these other sources of it, you're still going to get bad results. So, you know, that's where we just want to be careful, be aware of what reality is versus this idealized model and be prepared to kind of consider that what are the implications and so on and so forth but yeah yeah those errors are systematic errors and yeah. they'll skew everything to one side so that they don't get rid of the random errors and, and it, that can uh -huh. really mislead you when you're yeah you're doing Sorry. your analysis okay so you can get really clean wrong results <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so the, you know, there is the kind of issues with the sphere itself, then there is the issues with the calibration, again, with our relative measurements, so you want to be able to make sure that you are getting just the reflectance and transmittance of the sample itself, so you have to really know where the source of light might be, what other signals might be present. So again, you know, you have your empty sphere with a reflectance standard on the other side. That will give you your maximum result. You know, so you would have your um, illumination calibration uh, based on a reference standard. And again, you know, you can have a 99% reflectance standard that could be very close to the reflectance standard of the entire sphere. That would be your upper limit. But again, depending on your sample and signal noise, you could actually use a 50%, a lower reference standard, just to go through and better map the calibration and the signal noise of your system itself. We can talk about that later. But you also want to have dark measurements as well to account for any background light, stray light that might be present, any bias in your sensor, and so on and so forth. So you have your you know, dark measurement, you have your reference measurement in order to go through and calibrate your system to get um, your calibrated reflectance and transmittance. And of course, any error in there is going to cause issues coming on. So you have to be careful with that. Um, and then when it comes to the processing, you know, luckily for you, you know, code is freely available at the web. And if you have issues with the code, you can talk to the guy in the back of the room. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot of your fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's isn't that the, the classic response? If someone says, well, I've been using your code and I get really real, you know, you're not, you're not using my code right. My <laughs> you are the issue. But yeah, but, you know, I mean, there is a lot of these different considerations. And, you know, I mean, thankfully, we have people who have looked at this for quite some time and put a lot of thought into that to really consider all the practical and physical parameters involved in these types of measurements. So again, you know, with this code, you know, it really accounts for different, phys you know, the properties of the integrating sphere, the size of the sphere, the reflectivity of the wall, the number of ports, the size of the ports, so on and so forth. The sample geometry and specular reflection, whether the sample uh, is sandwiched between, you know, microscope slides to account for those additional index of refraction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is inside this sphere? Like, is it vacuum or is there air? It's air. It's usually just completely open. So, so yeah, so that's where, you know, if it's not in use and you don't have it covered, it can accumulate dust, and then that can impact the performance of that. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, we will, in the afternoon lab, we actually have a physical setup, a very simple, say, tutorial version of an integrating sphere setup, so you can actually see the physical parameters and see what the sphere looks like and experience firsthand on 
why all of us love to make uh, inverse adding doubling measurements and using integrating spheres. But again, there's the utility and there is the headache that you have to go through to get there. Um, but yeah, thanks to Scott's code, here we have the considerations of sample geometry. You know, whether you have a direct sample or you have it in a cuvette to account for the glass and the boundaries and Fresnel reflections between all that. And the biggest thing, and you know, the most amazing thing is, is again, the other aspect of these spheres yeah. is it assumes that the spheres, when you're illuminating your sample, will collect all angles in the forward and backward direction. But again, your sample has a physical thickness. Light can scatter. It can actually go through. And instead of you know, scattering in some angle back in here, in terms of the light coming in, so this would be the reflectance, this would be the transmit. Light can kind of scatter and propagate and actually exit out here. So it never gets measured. So if you're trying to account for everything, you know, these are sources of loss, this kind of side light loss. And that is something that this perfect model, the simplified model, won't account for. And so, you know, what Scott's code does is it can make those kind of calculations and say, if this is really the answer, it can then run some Monte Carlo to say, if this is really what the result is, how many photons did we lose just to the physical reality of our sample and then readjust it from there? And so there is an additional uh, sanity check to go through and say, you know, we don't live in a one dimensional world when we make our measurement. So when we do our calculations in a one dimensional world, what, what might we be losing here and how do we account for that? And so that's where it also iterates through that steps. And, you know, that was pretty trivial to do, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so there's a lot of really cool stuff that Scott has put together. So I have just the general software link here. But if you can go through, they have, you know, a link to the inverse adding doubling. And there are multiple versions of the code. So, you know, there are versions and GitHub, there are other executables, or is it just C code that you'd have to compile yourself, or? Um, I distribute, I do a Windows binary, but everybody else just compiles, run types make, and you make your own, or compile your own, so. Yeah, so do you want to add anything else to the code since you wrote it and what the latest versions have? Uh, read the manual. Um, <laughs> the, the manual is um, uh, will save you some issues. It's all about things you need to worry about as an experimentalist. So, um, yeah, and uh, it, it may save you some time. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I definitely found back when we were first setting this up, that manual was very well written and very clear, very helpful on a lot of the practical aspects. So it saves you a lot of time. Don't just run the code like I did the first time. <laughs> or run the code and yeah, then go, well, oh, what does this mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's where I was more confused. And then when I finally just read through, I'm like, oh yeah, now this makes perfect sense. So, so yeah, so it is a very useful resource. The manual itself, and then the code is the icing on the cake when you're actually doing it. But um, there's a lot of clarity involved with that. I just want to make a plug for that website in general, which is the OMLC website. If you haven't seen it, it's awesome. It's oh, also wow. hasn't been really touched in a decade. So, mm -hmm. so um, there are no pop-ups. <laughs> Major seller. We're getting no ad revenue from this. Yes. Yeah. The beautiful thing is you also see you also see Scott's humor, in, like just sprinkled throughout the different pages of the website. So it's yeah, it's, it's a fun read. Yeah. So in addition to the software page where they have, I mean, you have a Monte Carlo, you have a me. There's me code, yeah. There's 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 like areas my I think problems. four at least four. Well on GitHub code. there's also speckle and there's ways to measure your laser beam size from a um, and 
there's some heat transfer. There, there's a bunch of crap there. Yeah, there's a bunch of you know, little calculators as well for quick questions. And again, you know, the compiled spectra for a lot of different things. So that's been a very often cited. I don't know. Like, do you actually get credit if a no. website is cited? <laughs> no, it's. it's I mean, you know, it's, it's got to be like you know, easily like five thousand, ten thousand citations of a web link. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, so so yeah, there there there's a lot more going on there than just this. But yeah, I mean, this is really I think the easiest way to actually just try to make these type of measurements, try to do the calculations and guide it through without you know too much drama or stress. So yeah, I think you know, we should all be very thankful for this. And yeah. Your next tattoo should be this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, basically, to kind of wrap up just the kind of fundamental aspects and the kind of practical aspects, you know, the kind of take home messages, you know, in this case, but also should be applied more generally as well, is you know, there's this need to really understand what the practical constraints and limitations of a model, you know, in order to really exploit the advantages um, of this kind of approach, you know, based on what you're looking for. And, you know, I think that's true in general. It's like whenever you're doing something, you're using something because it's really good at this. You know, I would say as a researcher, it's more important to really understand what it doesn't do. So you are aware of what its limitations are. You don't cross that boundary, but also, you know, I've also personally found that the limitations, the things where it makes the errors are actually the more interesting aspects because it really starts to bring the opportunity of what new thing can you bring to the table. If this can't do this, or if this does something wrong in a known way, how can you exploit that and take advantage of it? So oftentimes limits are the more important part to utilizing something that it strengths. Um, but when it comes to this, I have basically three main rules uh, to think about when doing inverse adding Dublin. And so the first rule is really on what it is you're trying to measure. So again, we have this whole way of reducing everything down to one dimension. If you're measuring a sample, think about, well, is this an appropriate sample? Or can we uh, prepare the sample in a slightly different way to minimize these non-idealities that our model was designed around? So again, things like sample thickness. Yeah, we know that in terms of reflectance and transmittance, you're going to get different values for reflectance and transmittance based on how thick the sample is. So that's going to go in that parameter space between you know, transmittance values, reflectance values, and you know to kind of go through and say well if i change the thickness you know do we get combinations of those two in a safer space or is it going to be in an extreme where the uniqueness of a solution is really tight and collapsed so that's something you can change and, and think about perhaps um you know thinner samples could help minimize side light losses but also Thinner samples will have very low reflectance and transmittance values because it's not interacting too much. So those are things to kind of play back and forth. And sample preparation. So the other aspect is, is you know, whatever you're trying to measure, it needs to mimic something that is homogeneous and infinite in lateral extent. So you know, surface roughness is an issue. That's something that inverse adding Dublin or the model won't account for. You know, make sure that the thickness is even, because if you're making two different measurements, everything scales with thickness. You want to make sure that you're measuring the same thing every single time, and that it's going to be homogeneous. Um, and you know, so to, to simulate what this one-dimensional case will be. So those are things from the sample you want to consider and see in an experimental setup. Can we optimize this? Can we prepare the sample in a certain way that will make it easier for us to be confident in the results that we get? The other aspect is to think about the instrument and the instrument design and setup. So how stable, what is performance, how configurable it can be, 
you know, these systems are very lossy. There's a lot, lot of signal loss. It's very weak. Um, so you get a lot of noise. You can you know, take longer times to get better signal to noise. But you know, again, you have a simple system, source, sphere, detector, three different parts. It makes it sound simple, but each one is very critical. You have to really know inside and out what it does, how it works, and how it performs. <clears throat> so single spheres are easy to cal calibrate, but collimating light, especially if you're using a broadband source, is a bit of a tricky thing. So this afternoon, we have a broadband light source integrating sphere set up. With lenses, you know there's chromatic aberration. So if you want to have a, chromatic, uh, a collimated beam from visible to near infrared, it's pretty hard. You know, that's a little challenging to keep it collimated over that broad spectral range. So in this setup, we actually use uh, reflective elements, so parabolic mirrors to do that. And they're very tricky to align. So um, if you want to uh, make tin cry, <laughs> Move the mirror, and you know you, you can see a grown man cry. Uh, but please don't. <laughs> but you know, so those are the different things. Is you know, you you're making measurements. Sensors give you numbers. Light comes from sources. There's a lot of stuff that can happen to the signal in between. So, you know, in these cases, you want to be very careful, or at least understand what's going on. So yeah, I mentioned single spheres here. You can have a dual sphere set up. There are different configurations. You know, I've been mostly talking about reflectance and transmittance. You can make a third measurement of unscattered light. Um, that is also useful for you know kind of measuring absorption, scattering, and anisotropy. But they have their own problems, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But just kind of. Keep things in mind, you know, what we've been doing here is with the collimated beam using a variable iris where you can actually change the spot size so you can illuminate larger or smaller areas just as a sanity check there. And then the I will say on that, that slide that um, one thing to not overlook is that there are spectrometers with built-in integrating spheres and they do uh, match beam. So the beam hits the sample and then it toggles and hits the sphere wall and um, then it reports a, a reflection measurement and these are very stable and they eliminate a lot of the, the single sphere problems that um, when you you don't when you're not doing that differencing uh, scheme so um, I've been very impressed by some of the the data that, that's been taken with those um, spectrometers with built-in integrated spheres yeah anything with a spectral measurement. If a company mm -hmm. already builds it for you, they've had a lot more people on an engineering design team figure out all those issues for you. Might be expensive, but again... Well, there might, might be some fun in the back back hallway that nobody uses. That, that's... that's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that's step one. <laughs> Check all the closets. See if <laughs> there. And then step two, beg your uh, supervisor to say it's worth the investment. <laughs> and then I guess step three is use it a lot to prove it was well worth it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I mean, building these things from scratch, you know, a lot of things can go wrong. So any step you can do where other people have had multiple people design together makes a lot of sense. So, and then the last thing is, is have some, you know, it's not wrong to have an expectation as to what you think you're going to measure. I mean, there is always the danger of if you're looking to see a result, you will make measurements and continue to make it until you get that result. So there is that kind of confirmation bias. Um, but you know, in general terms, you know, if you know it's going to be high absorption, weekly scattering, that you have that kind of expectation. So you kind of know where in the parameter space you would be, what considerations you might have to say, do we need to change the physical consider you know, uh, setup of our system? Do we need to change the sample preparation in these cases? Can I ask a quick question yes. on the last slide? Can you go back? Um, 
<clears throat> Can you go over the sentence tools for your setups do not need combination? So in general, the dual sphere? Yes. Yeah, so the idea of the dual sphere is you would have two spheres and you'd, your sample in the middle. So simultaneously, the first sphere will get all your reflectance, the second will get your, all your transmittance at the same time. So it's there, you know, again, as opposed to a single sphere where you have different physical locations for one thing or the other. You want to have your illumination being the same at both places. So for a single sphere, you want to have the same beam diameter here as here. And so it becomes very important to have it nicely collimated so it is the same. When you have it at the same location, you know, it's experiencing the same thing at the same time, then the collimation aspect is not as critical. So it just takes two spheres. And there are other things that you can get, you know, straight light from one sphere into another and stuff like that. So there you know, other things to kind of consider, but yeah, there's pluses and minuses. Yeah, collimation is, is only needed if you want an unscattered transmission measurement. You put a hole in your second sphere so the collimated light, can, unscattered light can leave. Um, but that's uh, often not worth the effort. Yeah, so. So yeah, so I have a lot of text here. So again, I think, you know, with this expectation, with your system performance and your sample preparation, again, you know, think about these different parameter spaces to say if you have a sample of a given thickness versus something else, where along this distribution those values might be to say how reliable and robust something might be in that case. So that was all that. And then for the last 20 minutes, just wanted to go briefly over a couple examples and say, where might you actually use this? So you know, there's this technique. And you know, as much as I say this is a good technique, I've been also saying it's really painful and difficult to work through. So when you know, might it be worth it? Um, so you know, these are older examples, but um, you know, there is an ex vivo tissue example that we did, and this was when I was still here. Actually, both of these are when I was still here in Irvine. Um, but then the other aspect was looking at tissue simulating phantoms, which, again, something I'm very passionate about, and there's a lot of interesting things to think about that when you start to talk about layered tissues, thin layers. Well, how do you know what each layer optical properties are? You can measure them individually. Uh, with the integrating sphere set up and then stack them, combine them together to see how influential each contribution was in that case. So the ex vivo example was something that um, we had done with Bernard's group. Um, he had a PhD student who was looking at optical clearing of a uh, mouse brain. And the idea here is that if you could clear the tissue, you can segment that stain the vasculature in the brain, and then maybe with just, say, 10 slices, do confocal uh, microscopy and actually have a volumetric image uh, basically of 10 different slices, recombine it, and you will have a full vascular network of the entire brain. Whereas if it's scattering, you would just have to do, I think, was like what a thousand slices more <laughs> without that so you know there was a clear advantage if you wanted to do this type of reconstruction of vascular networks with optical clearing but what other changes in the uh, tissue structure do these clearing agents do how long do you uh, have the optical clearing agent exposed to the tissue are there different considerations that go through and have? You know, what are essentially the changes in scattering as a function of time with these different um, uh, optical clearing agents? And again, is this a semi-infinite semi in lateral extent tissue? No. Is it perfectly homogeneous? No. But it's exaggerated. 
So there's really not much blood, there's very low absorption, there's some differences in scattering, but you can at least get a general expectation of changes. So you know, the bar was pretty low. <laughs> they really go through and see, we know there's going to be these imperfections in it, but the general question was, can we just measure how clear it is in a quantitative way, isolate the scattering from the absorption, and look spectrally to say, are the changes in the scattering over time also shifting, indicating swelling or other structural changes due to the optical clearing agent? Is the background grid one centimeter? I believe that was supposed to be one centimeter, yeah. Okay. Yeah, these are, I think it was playing cards. The playing yeah, cards, that I, yeah. I don't know. So they're much the other, yeah, there was no, there was nothing specific about the, uh, um, so, uh, I think this question for Professor Barnard. So what type of optical cleaning you use here? This was a chemical that uh, is called Focus Clear. It's just a, Focus clear. yeah, we, we moved on from that. Oh. Um, which which one, one you it, it wreaks havoc on some of the floor fours we use. So which one do you use right now? We're using a, we've modified, there's, so there's an established one, there's a few established techniques and there's a whole bunch more that come out. Uh, we've been using IDISCO. Oh, okay. Like a mod Isco, right? modified version yeah, of it. So there is a controversial information that some people say the optic clean, clear, clear, clear C, or I, I forgot the name, clean, clear, or something like Dr. Maddie, who published this one from Baylor College of Medicine. Okay. Clean, clear, and IDISCO. So what's the basic difference you see? Does, Clean clear people, they claim that there is no squeezing during this um, uh, clearing, and they uh, they compare this result with different other uh, optical cleaning method. Mm -hmm. But recently, I have seen like most of the, especially in the SPIA, so like most of the people they use iris co, yeah, and they say that iris co is much better than clean clean clear or PSC. I, I forgot the name. I think it's clean clear. I, the method. So, which one you prefer? Because <laughs> you are measuring the optical properties and all those things, and you have the like a I, idea. I mean, a lot of it is the. I mean, I guess it's going on a tangent, but okay. uh, just as a kind of a quick response, a lot of it is depends on the clarity of the sample that you want, or the, the it's not just the clarity, it's also compatibility with whatever you're trying to measure. And so, we found that focus clear, for instance. With, we used a different vascular label and, and basically washed it all out. It's just, just, it's just the, the chemicals. Versus uh, iDisco does a really good job preserving. So that was more important to us. So, uh, and for focus clear, have you also seen the tissue squeezing things? Some Contraction? Yeah. You get a little bit. Yeah, you definitely get a little bit. iDisco, you also get a little bit too. So that you have to, it's, it's a little bit time. Yes. Um, but clarity makes it. Big. So it's like it's it's you know that takes forever. So it's it's kind of like how do you want to do it? And why do you make that? So how many slides you mean for the focus clear for measuring the focus blur? We did focus blur. We did uh, to get an entire brain. You would get roughly about ten sections. Ten sections. Okay. Um, sometimes twenty, depending. Okay. Uh, yeah, we we'll, we can talk more about this later. Sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, I mean, you pretty much explained it. So again, you know, this was you know, the ultimate goal with the fluorescent tag and the vasculature. And again, at different time points when you had still scattering present, you know, you got very low contrast, low resolution, and you know, the bees don't do it too much justice at the later times is that you know, with the reduction of scattering, you really got higher resolution, clearer um, ways to track the vasculature. And so, you know, that was just the general question. And again, you know, with the integrating sphere set up, basically, you know, we have these samples and they would be, you know, exposed to the focus clear. And, you know, at the different time points, uh, what we did is we basically used just Thorlabs parts with optical windows. So, you know, we would put the sample inside here we have two glass windows holding it in place, and then that way we could mount it in front of the sphere uh, for the transmittance in the back for the reflectance. We would move the sample around to basically sample multiple locations just to make sure that there wasn't too much heterogeneity that made too much of an impact. But basically, that's the setup we had. So we would put the brain in here, 
have one measurement with our light source coming in, another measurement here going to the spectrometer. So we would have multiple measurements at the different time points. And again, you know, our ex vivo tissue absorption, we just assumed would be constant. And looking at the data to confirm it, it pretty much was. So there wasn't that much change going on. There weren't that many chemical alterations with the process. And also the sample volume remained constant. So there wasn't really swelling or contraction in a larger scale case. You know, we weren't very too precise on that. But we measured the thickness, I remember. Yeah. I mean, coppers. Yeah, yeah, and I think with the sample chamber, we had it set where there was a spacer inside yeah. that kind of made it always yeah. a constant thickness. And so, you know, again, we then interpreted any changes in the reduced scattering as a ratiometric me method to kind of look at the clearing potential. So relative to a uncleared sample, how much or what fraction of reduced scatter or reduction in scattering was present. So, you know, this optical clearing potential is, you know, your original reduced scattering ratio here. And so over the different time points, basically, you know, if unscattered or uncleared tissue would be at one, after one hour, three hours, six hours, 12 hours. So again, we could see you know, the kind of gross objective, the very simple, modest request was, you know, can we just go through and have a quasi quantitative way to see how much clearing happened over how much time? But also, since this is wavelength dependent, we could also look at any of the potential shifts Changes there would be changes in the brief parameter of scattering, which would be related to the kind of mean size distribution versus amplitude. That we could also ask that, and it was relatively flat. There were some changes over time, but you know, at this one, it was for the modest question we were originally asking. It was a nice, clean way of trying to get some way to assess what the changes of scattering were, rather than just a visual interpretation um, you know and again the idea is a future work to say you know, what the kind of spectral dependence of it was to try to see what else was going on but you know that was something where the sample itself was far from perfect far from ideal but you know being able to kind of position this experiment in the way that you're aware of that but tested other things you know what it is it that you wanted to get versus you know, what is it that the measurement could provide you know, to always be somewhat cautious and look at it. Uh, so that was one case. And then with phantoms, you know, a lot of the work that I've been interested in and still interested in is looking at layered models of tissue. Yes. And the concept of optical clearing is still a little confusing for me. And um, for me, brain has white matter and it's highly scattering. So I use it for imaging. When you talk about optical clearing and decreasing the scattering, I would like to know how optical clearing works and how it changes the brain. We'll, we'll talk about it after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's the last time I do you a favor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a reminder of all the different things you. Yeah. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so the other aspect was, you know, kind of layered models of skin and all that. And again, you know, this idea that we have spectral techniques, light transport techniques, you know, that depending on the wavelength you use will go into skin to different depths. And so, you know, this classical thing that I had started to play around with was having a system that had both visible and near infrared light with the hypothesis that visible light would be more superficial, near infrared would go much deeper. And so the contributions between the epidermis and the dermis would vary as a function of wavelength. And that way, if you had a layer structure, visible light would have a higher representation of epidermal properties versus something that would have more dermal type of properties. And again, the idea here is particularly in terms of skin pigmentation, 
how do we know what the influence is, how significant, and what are the consequences of different skin types and different skin pigments? So the classic way is, is you could have some confounding aspects of if you have darker skin, is it because you have a high concentration in a thin layer, or is it just the same concentration as somebody else, but something that might be three times as thick? So there was that kind of layer thickness question, but also since different wavelengths penetrate different depths, the influence of melanin could distort that penetration depth of each wavelength, and so you could actually have spectral distortion as a consequence of the amount of melanin present. And so, you know, what we first did is, again, like any good student of this course, you start off with a series of Monte Carlo simulations, simulate the results. Um, here it was a two-layer uh, model. We used just some uh, melanin volume fraction from Steve Zirox and just said, well, all we're going to do is same concentration, vary the thickness with some constant amount of oxy and deoxy hemoglobin underneath, and just as a function of the layer thickness, what would a simulated uh, spatial frequency domain measurement produce in terms of absorption and in scattering? And here, the simulation that says, as a function of thickness, we could see that there was some distortion in the absorption result, you know, not by changing the concentration of anything, just that epidermal thickness. And our idea was, well, you know, if we know the absorption and scattering, the mean absorption and scattering in every single wavelength, we can estimate the depth penetrance of the light. So if we can estimate this is the mean absorption and scattering per volume, each wavelength that took you, could we then go through and say, can we then estimate how thick that top layer is and how much concentration that melanin was? So we had a very simple empirical approach to make some rough estimates of oxy deoxy melanin concentration in two different spectral regimes. What is the mean depth those two different regimes estimate? And just a sheer simple algebraic approach to say, okay, based on these differences, what would a top layer thickness have to be? And did some calculations. So again, what the top layer thickness was, what this simple empirical approach seemed to infer. And again, you know, pretty close, the thicker it got, it started to get farther off, but okay, it's a rough estimate. But, you know, it might not be accurate, but is it good enough? So, you know, when we started to look at, well, if our actual melanin concentration in the top layer, again, this was just 1%, what did our corrected method produce? And again, you know, it's values that were within 5%. Okay, is that good or bad? Well, we could look at if we are only looking at visible light or near infrared light to see what its estimate would be. And so even though this wasn't perfect, it was still far more accurate than just trying to do something on that alone. So we have some simulations and say, this is a very simple empirical approach. Simulations say it's quite promising. How do we really test it out? So that's where we would start to go with skin phantoms. And of course, to make it more challenging, I wanted to have completely arbitrary um, absorption properties of these different layers. So we started off with just a top layer with a known thickness, and there were multiple thicknesses of this little sheet that would you know, emulate the epidermis, and then there would be a dermal tissue that it could be stacked on top of. We could then make measurements of the two layers together to see what those influences are and run through. And of course, we can characterize these phantoms. So, you know, one case is looking at skin. Is the physical dimensions relevant to that? So again, estimates in human skin of the epidermis and dermis versus what our phantoms were. But then we could also go through with inverse adding doubling, measure those thin layers, and actually get what those optical properties of each layer are independently before we mix them together. And then say, if we know what the answer is, we put them together, make the measurement of them together. Can we 
extrapolate and extract back out what each component was. And so, yeah, we characterize it with the integrating sphere. And so now in these cases, you know, these are the thicknesses of the phantom. This is what our reconstruction um, simple empirical method said it would be. We could then go through, do these different calculations. And of course, yeah, if it's supposed to be 100% con uh, concentration of the nap bell green, yeah, we're off. But, you know, again, it's still a better estimate than nothing at all. And that started to really, you know, start to indicate, well, you know, is this relevant for, you know, in vivo applications? What are the consequences of not accounting for a layer structure where we're doing it? Um, and just utilizing a homogeneous model is the fact that when we started to look at the bottom layer uh, results is that if you had a very thin epidermal layer, you know, you would be okay. Using near infrared light, it penetrates the deepest. You know, the theory always was that you know, melanin is weaker absorbing in the near infrared, so you're going deeper, you're mostly sampling the stuff underneath, it should be less sensitive to pigmentation. And in the thin layer, yeah, you get 90% versus 100. The correction, okay, you're, you're pretty close to that. Um, but when you started to get all these other things, you know, again, you started to get worse and worse results here, where these, again, may not have been perfect, but they were within a few percent, so that helped normalize all that. So that was very positive, and that motivated actually doing an in vivo study of different skin types, where our point of reference there was multi-photon microscopy. That was a heavy, difficult experiment, and it would be difficult to motivate it without having these steps first. So this was you know, a very useful intermediary tool because you know, we could accurately determine what each layer property was. In the clinic, in vivo, we can't go through and have an accurate estimate of what epidermal absorption and scattering properties are. And in fact, when we were doing it clinically, we referenced it as Fitzpatrick scale skin type, and that even isn't an accurate representation of melanin concentration there. It's an imperfect world, so we wanted to make sure we have the backup of that, and that's using these phantoms. And of course, since then, we've been working on improving that to have better looking dermis phantoms and more you know, melanin looking uh, phantoms for the top layer, where we can have variable thicknesses, variable concentrations, know what each sample is independently, put them together, make a measurement, and then see what the impact of this is when we're trying to extract information here to really know what it is. So we can kind of emulate skin types with controlled standards to really get a better hold of this. And again, why is this relevant? You know, we did measurements where we actually went in vivo, and again, it's Patrick scale, but the general sense is low pigmentation, high pigmentation. And what was really surprising to me at the time was if you were just using near infrared light to estimate blood oxygenation, you could see there was a very strong trend that there was this distortion due to melanin that would be interpreted as a reduction in uh, oxygenation. You know, in transmission, you know, there was this uh, big article that was put out um, that in pulse oximeter, it was actually the opposite. And there the concern was is that strong pigmentation, it would overestimate oxygenation. And there in emergency room care is the fact that alarms wouldn't set up, be set off if someone started to crash. There would be a time delay, and we heard yesterday that time is very important in those types of situations, that there was that kind of ethnic and racial bias in the measurements we make. So, you know, that was, you know, something where we could solve the problem, we could be better at discriminating dermal versus epidermal uh, tissues, but, you know, this really showed, and it's important, you know, this is an important thing to address. And of course, this also went where we have now collaborated to make 
you know, more complex phantoms where they have multiple layers, where this can be replaceable for different skin types and skin pigmentations. So this is looking at cerebral oximeters, where the FDA now is really concerned about all these commercially available devices and what kind of um, bias might be present in that to make sure that everything is coming along. So there we went through and made an even more complex phantom to test that out. And that's what they're currently looking to develop further to have these standardized tests to ensure that there is no um, racial bias in any optical device coming out. So that's where a lot of those things are. I am well over time, so I'll just end it there. But I'll post all these slides because it's a lot of text. So at least you can look at the text and not have to remember the side of my voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's been a long day. Uh, it's still going to go on. <laughs> we have uh, <laughs> lunch, and then the lab is going to be both simulated data for inverse adding doubling, where you can have you know, simulated data to load, change the different parameters, just to see how do all these different parameters in the measurement impact your results. And you know, I think the audience is groups you know, of maybe six or so, so we can have, we have some actual phantom samples oh. that you can actually make measurements of three different thicknesses of the same phantom and actually process the data okay what does the actual processing look like how confident can you be in these types of measurements what questions would you ask based on those results so a little bit more hands-on experimental work with simulated work but we'll try to make it fun is the system in the lab or is it give me the library i mean it's on a cart so you can have it out in the back here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's thank Roll.